Live from the motherland, from the United Kingdom. The last time you saw or heard us, we were in the United States. Now we're back in the real United Kingdom of the world, i.e. the United Kingdom. Doctor, now Dr. Milo Wolf is uh, here with us. He's no longer a mere human being, but is now part of the real doctor community. In terms of this apply, not a medical doctor. We are here. You feel me? We, we are now PhD. We are now doctor. I passed my defense as of two weeks ago, I think, and I am about to submit the amendments. So as of now, basically, I have a PhD and I'm a doctor. Fun fact, I actually asked the examiners after the defense, so when do I get to call myself a doctor? And they basically told me whenever, uh, because technically you're only a doctor by the time you receive your certificate in the mail. But gauging by previous experiences, aka Dr. Pack over here, that can take quite a while. So I, I'm not going to wait around for the certificate to arrive. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you actually look into it, it has to also be uh, um, after the graduation because that's when, in theory, they tell you, oh, we now give you the degree officially, even if you have the degree officially. But hey-ho, who cares? Um, just don't look into whether we actually have PhDs. Take our word for it. They're there. You know, what was our, th- our thesis, to- thesis topic? That's none of your business. You know, it's 2023 it privacy. Made on phds.com at the bottom of my certificate. Don't ask questions. Just look at the nice certificate. And there's a few studies from your PhD that will be you'll be looking to publish at some point in the near future. Indeed. There's, besides the uh, now infamous meta-analysis on range of motion, there will be four other studies eventually. Three of them are completed, and the fourth one is the upper body one we've mentioned before, comparing length and partials to full range of motion in trained lifters in the actual program. But the three studies that have been done are, one, a survey study looking at how people actually use range of motion when training for hypertrophy and strength, what they think about it, what stops them from doing different ranges of motion, like pain potentially and stuff. An interview study in competitive athletes in physique and strength sports, looking at, broadly speaking, the same things but looking at whether or not there's any differences in actual sports versus just training for fun um, or for hypertrophy or strength, whatever. And then finally, there is one study where I basically looked at the effects of partial range of motion training versus full range of motion training, but where the partial range of motion was performed at the same average muscle length as the full range of motion training. So kind of doing half reps in the middle of the full range of motion to see whether when we equate for average muscle length being trained, there's still an effect of range of motion itself on hypertrophy. So those three studies I will be trying to publish eventually in the next, you know, three to six months. And that's for preprints and probably next year or so when we're talking about the additional delay granted by the oh-so-good journals that we have around. Or you could wait for the university to publish your thesis as a PDF on their website. For me, um, it's been... Two and a half years since I graduated, it's still not there. So, yeah, you know, anytime, anytime so now. Who knows? Or even a doctor? No one can verify. Yeah. Where's her thesis? Thankfully, though, due to the good doctor uh, James Steele and the good doctor James Fisher, we, um, you will be publishing all your studies from your PhD, similarly to me. So it's all out there versus that random one. You know, the typical thesis PDF that you find, where it's like four hundred pages, and you got to look through stuff, and, and it's in it's Portuguese for some reason. And so I can't read it. Uh, it makes me very frustrated. That's awesome. And um, we are here to talk about a brand new study hot off the press, aka off the preprint press, by the good lads over in Florida uh, and obviously a bunch of other people from... Shout out Boca Raton. And uh, from New Zealand as well. Good doctor, uh, Eric Helms and... Who else is from New Zealand on that paper? Just scanning it quickly. I think it's just just uh, Dr. Helms. Is Martin Rafalo on it? I don't think he is, right? No, and I see the affiliations, and I see only once, and the only two is next to Dr. Helms' name, um, wow. who has two affiliations, one upping everybody else and being better than everyone. As a WNBF pro as well, shout out to him. Oh, wow, I didn't realize he also holds a position or has an affiliation with FAU as opposed to just being at Auckland. That's very cool. I think from what we've seen, uh, affiliations are a bit of, like you could. We could write Harvard, and uh, nobody would would actually like. There's no process of verifying your affiliation. Can you prove I didn't get my PhD at Harvard? Yes. 
How? Go on. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was like, oh, well, fuck you then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll claim to be a PhD graduate if, from Harvard if I want to. All right. Yes, Harvard, Smarvard. Um, and the paper is called The Effect of Resistance Training Proximity to Failure on Muscular Adaptations and Longitudinal ha- Fatigue and Trained Men. Which Woo! doesn't mean anything to anyone exactly. ever. Basically, this paper tried to look at the effects of using the same program, but training at different RPEs or different proximities to failure. Like, for example, training at RP 4 to 6 versus training at RP 10, right? So training with 4 to 6 reps in the tank versus training with every set to failure, to actually failing a rep. And seeing whether there's any differences in how much fatigue that causes, what sort of muscle growth you see, and what sort of strength improvements you see on the squat and bench in this case. Yeah, and something that you hear often um, sort of thrown around in regards to fatigue and gains is that, you know, fatigue is something that you really need to be to be wary of and that it is something that can come off, uh, come out of nowhere, essentially, and sabotage your gains. But as you will see from this paper and the literature as a whole, um, I don't think that you should be super worried about fatigue. Obviously, some terms are going to supply. So, no, I agree, I agree with that. I think... Uh... Do we want to talk about the methods first before we head into the results? Yes, I was about to say so. What did they do? Basically, they took uh, 38 lifters and put them through a resistance training program that was three days a week. Um, in this program, they performed mainly the squat and bench, did about 10 sets a week for both. And they also did some accessory work on the shoulder press. Uh, bicep curl, lateral raise, and some more exercises. But for the most part, the intervention was very upper body heavy. They only did the squat for lower body. But yeah, it also included stuff like barbell shoulder press, barbell rows, barbell curls, barbell tricep extensions, basically having a good time with the upper body training. Uh, Their rep and set schemes for the squat and bench specifically, which were kind of the two main exercises being investigated, they did three to four sets across the whole study for in each session, for 10 reps, 8 reps, or basically between 10 and 4 reps throughout the whole program. Before the program started and after it concluded, they tested a variety of things. Some of those things were ultrasounds of the pec and of the vastus lateralis, so pec and quad muscles, and also tested the 1 rep maxes for the squat and bench press exercises to see whether or not different RPEs would lead to different strength gains. They also looked at some fatigue metrics. Specifically, they looked at some physiological markers like uh, lactate dehydrogenase and creatine kinase, two markers of muscle damage. They looked at some more subjective pers- like markers of fatigue, like, for example, having participants rate their fatigue on the perceived recovery scale, which is a scale that's been validated in predicting how fatigued is someone and how does that in, like track with their performance. Um, they also looked at their muscle soreness across the whole study. So they tried to get a variety of measurements across the study to see whether or not, for example, you could get used to um, training at different RPEs, whether it would still cause more fatigue down the line, because we have data suggesting that when you train to failure, that causes more fatigue than not training to failure. So it was kind of looking at, are there going to be differences over time in how fatiguing training to failure versus not training to failure are? Essentially, that was the design. Anything else you think is worth adding? Uh, no, I think you covered everything. As strength goes, and uh, we're going to talk about back squat strength first. Um, the all groups observed some uh, form of strength increases. So, if we're going to talk about like, I'll call them averages, but not are not really averages. The group that was uh, staying between four to six, uh, four to six RPE, have gained around thirteen kilos uh, on their squat. The group that stayed between seven to nine uh, RPE gained about 18 kilos on their squat, whereas the group that hit 10 RP, the failure group, uh, gained just 5.45 kilos on their squat on average. Um, With the authors saying that the increases observed in the group that hit failure were not uh, deemed meaningful per se. Yeah, so the approach they used in the paper was they essentially defined the smallest effect size of interest or the smallest improvement of interest, essentially, as being the average measurement error. 
And so in this case, the average measurement error for the back squat was just under eight kilograms or so thereabouts. And so the group training every set to failure, so actually failing rep on every set, only observed an average increase in their squat of about five kilograms. And therefore, based on the analysis used here, it was deemed below that threshold, right? Does it mean that they didn't see any improvements? Not necessarily, but it does mean that in general, the trend emerged that, hey, people saw better gains when training for the squat at an RP of seven to nine or four to six versus an RP of 10 generally. Yeah. And for bench press strength, just to go again over, over the averages, the averages in quotation marks, the group that stayed between four to six RP gained around nine kilos on average on their bench strength. The group that was between seven and nine RP was again, around nine, 9.7 kilos. Um, the group that was between seven and nine plus uh, RP was around five kilos of strength. And lastly, the 10 RP group barely gained any strength. Uh, so they were, they, they had an average strength increase of 0 0.7 kilos, which is crazy to see. Um, so similar, similar ish uh, results between lifts with yeah. uh, the, yeah, sorry. No, I tend to agree. Uh, as you said, like with the best gains occurring with RPEs of four to six or seven to nine, broadly speaking, and worse strength gains being had with higher RPEs of either a 10 RP on every set, so hitting failure on every set, or with an RPE of seven to nine on every set with the last set being taken to failure. So yeah. generally, essentially, the lower the RP, the better the strength gains, right? Mm. With uh, both the four to six RP group and the seven to nine RP group performing similarly. The important thing here that we didn't mention earlier that I want to bring up now is reps and sets were matched. What this means is that all groups perform the same sets and reps, right? The two things that changed between groups were the RPE that they actually hit, and this was cross-validated with movement velocity or bar speed, essentially, to make sure that they actually were, and the weight being used. So the RPE and the weight being used were the only differences in the training between groups. So, for example, the 10 RP group might have hit 3 by 8 at 100 kilograms. The 7 to 9 RP group might have hit 3 by 10 but at 90 kilograms because mm -hmm. they were aiming for a lower RP. And finally, the 4 to 6 RP group might have hit 3 by 10 at, or 3 by 8, sorry, at um, 80 kilograms, right? Because they were simply using a low RP. The only difference was the RP being achieved and the load being used as a consequence. The interesting thing is, if you look at the velocity data, the 4 to 6 RP group actually trained a little bit further from failure than they intended to. So they had more reps in the tank than they likely were aiming to have. So they weren't mm. training with four to six reps in the tank. They were actually training closer to eight reps in the tank. And for strength, they still saw some of the best gains in the study, which is really interesting. Yeah, they did indeed. If you if you look at the actual uh, figures from the study, uh, for strength specifically, the, the four to six group and the four to six RP and the seven to nine RP group, although the seven to nine RP group was slightly, it looks like they did slightly better. Um, if you compare those two groups with the higher RP groups, it's uh, there's a there's a clear there's a clear difference as far as strength goes. Yeah, but who cares about strength? RPs. Indeed, all we care about is getting jacked out here. And so let's talk about the hypertrophy results. With hypertrophy, things were a lot less clear, as the authors point out that there were a lot of difficulties during the study in running the ultrasounds. So this was this study was happening during COVID, which meant that not every ultrasound was being performed by the same technician, which is somewhat of a problem as far as reliability goes, right? When you're ultrasounding and when you're measuring things in general, you want to make sure you're measuring the same thing both times. So you can actually assess, was there a change? If you're not measuring the same thing every time, you could be seeing a difference, but that's not because it changed in and of itself. It's because you measured a different thing, like a different mm. location on the body or what have you. And so in this case, basically what happened is that the measurements weren't super reliable as a byproduct of the sites being measured potentially the pecs in my experience at least are a little bit harder to measure as a byproduct of different raters measuring it as a an inherent limitation of ultrasounds to be honest like this is something i've experienced with my studies as well is that ultrasounds just are not as reliable as people think and as a hot take i think the literature often has um an over-reported reliability. So people reporting that their ultrasounds are more consistent than they really are. But anyways, with this study, basically what happened is the differences between groups weren't that conclusive. Um, the, because the authors took an analysis approach where 
they define the smallest effect size or the smallest improvement of interest as being equivalent to the average measurement error. And in this case, their measurement error was actually quite large. As I mentioned, the ultrasounds weren't very reliable. The results are very difficult to interpret. Mm. I actually spoke to the authors and they basically said I wouldn't look at the results basically at all. I wouldn't overthink them. I'll give it a shot anyways, but I want you to keep in mind that these are very exploratory. I wouldn't hold them very strongly here. So broadly speaking, with a higher RPE, the participants in these groups actually saw less hypertrophy. And in fact, they even saw some atrophy. So they saw that their muscle size decreased from pre to post. So from before the training study and after the training study. Equally, generally, the increase in muscle size were superior with lower RPEs, which is kind of counter to the evidence we have, which if you look at the meta-analysis previously performed by the same authors, Robinson and colleagues, is that the closer you take a given set to failure, the more hypertrophy it generally causes. This study didn't find that. But again, I don't think these results should be overinterpreted on account of how unreliable the measurements really were. So yeah. broadly speaking, I think those are the hypertrophy results. Anything you think you want to add? No, not really. Um, it's just, again, single study, a lot of methodological issues, plus looking at the totality of evidence, uh, we shouldn't jump the gun here and go on the, hey, if you reach, reach 10 RP, you're going to lose muscle. Because if, if you look at the data uh, for both vastus lateralis and um, pec major muscle thickness differences, um, mm. the, the 10 RP condition, the group regressed, actually. For sure. Which, yeah, I don't know. One thing I want to bring up real quick before we move on to the recovery stuff and the fatigue stuff. For these measurements of hypertrophy and for the improvements in squat and bench strength, what's worth keeping in mind is that the participants in these groups performed on average 10 sets for the bench and 10 sets for the squat. So they were doing a reasonably high volume, and I think 10 sets a week for the squat and bench is a little bit on the low side for the squat, uh, sorry, for the bench compared to what most people do, and about right or still a little bit on the low side for what most people do for the squat when they're powerlifting, right? So these were reasonable volumes, but it's just worth keeping in mind. We're talking about 10 sets here. Who knows what would have happened if it was 20 sets of squats a week, right? Maybe then they would have seen even more favorable results when training at lower RPEs. Mm. Maybe it was the opposite. But I think it's worth keeping in mind that in this case, we're talking about 10 sets. Importantly, the same thing goes for the vast lateralis muscle thickness and the pec major muscle thickness. In this study, um, amongst all the muscle groups being trained, the pecs and quads were actually some of the least heavily trained muscles. So when you look at the biceps, for example, or the, sorry, not the biceps, the triceps, for example, these were being trained across the week with 19 sets. But the pecs and the quads were being trained across the week with 10 sets because the only things that were really training them were the squat and bench. And they were really only doing 10 sets for those. And so it's unclear whether with higher volumes, maybe, you know, lower RPs would have done even better or vice versa. But it's just worth keeping in mind again that these are 10 sets for each muscle group respectively. Did we mention how long the study was in terms of weeks? I don't think eight, we did. Yeah, this was a, an eight-week study, if I... not yeah. mistaken, which I'm not. No, it's, it's correct. Uh, I think, like... I think study duration is a relatively overvalued aspect of a study, because oftentimes we're talking about differences between eight and 12 weeks. Mm. And... Yeah, you can surmise that when you're talking about 26 weeks, like half a year or a whole year, the study would have looked different. But I think a lot of the time it's more, uh, it's less of a concern than people think. It's like, oh, eight weeks or it wasn't 10 weeks or what have you. Anyways, what about recovery and muscle damage? Do you want to hit One it second. Off? We, we haven't mentioned the most important uh, methodological design element of the study, which was that uh, participants received BCAAs uh, after uh, they did their workout. So Did they actually? You know. Yeah, they did. And oh, whey wow. protein as well, for some reason. I think that it has to do maybe with uh, some funding for the study. I'm not sure. Funding, incentivization to get people to actually participate, uh, maybe to see bigger effect sizes, because I'm not sure about BCAs, but having protein after a session might cause you to gain a little bit more muscle and strength, and therefore yeah, you that's can actually detect it. differences more easily. All right, let's head into recovery. You want to hit it off? Kinase and lactate dehydrogenase are both enzymes that are used as biomarkers of muscle damage. So essentially, just if value go up, you are more fatigued. If value go down, you are less fatigued. After you train, generally, you are fatigued, and therefore both creatine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase will go up in your bloodstream, right? 
So broadly speaking, they took an interesting approach, right? They looked yeah. at the time course of the of the elevations in these two biomarkers, not just pre to post a session, but mm. pre to post a session and how it then changed by the next session, which yeah. often occurred, you know, forty eight hours later. Um and they looked at this not just in week one, so when they first started the study and they were relatively like new to the stimulus, right? But also in week two and in week seven, so towards the end of the study, to see whether over time, as you repeated these sessions, you know, for example, training to failure consistently, the trend in how fatigued you got physiologically from that session would change. Now, basically what they found is there was minimal evidence of any sort of acclimation to either lower RP training or higher RP training physiologically. So physiologically, whether this was your first time being exposed to this training session or whether you'd been doing six weeks of this already, the increases in creatine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase as a response to these sessions didn't really change, right? Mm -hmm. You still saw meaningful increases and there wasn't really a clear trend. There is also not really a difference in the different groups, right? So you would expect generally the closer to failure you train, the more fatigue you see. Interestingly, in this study, that's really not all that clear. So the increases yeah. in creatine kinase and in lactate dehydrogenase, physiologically, there just didn't seem to be much more fatigue or any more fatigue in the higher RP groups versus the lower RP groups. Yep. What do you think? Exactly. No, it's it's um, it, it, even even looking at the at the figures, it just looks all very similar, and in yeah. some cases, almost yep. identical. For for anyone who's actually reading the paper real quick, just pay attention to the scales. For some reason, and I have to ask the authors about this and uh, maybe beef with them a little bit, they change the scales on the different graphs, and so it makes it a little bit tricky to look at. But if you look at the scales and you interpret it that way, uh, or look at the numerical values in text, you'll see that it's actually quite similar between groups. Anyhow, now soreness. Do you so, want soreness? Oh, as far as um, the soreness results of the study go, now... What the authors did here, uh, in, co uh, in contrast to what we've done in the past, where we've used like a soreness scale where people rated their soreness from zero to five, um, they used a pressure pain threshold in order to assess um, DOMS. And they essentially defined that as the minimal amount of pressure that was needed in order to induce pain. So if there was a decrease in the pressure pain threshold, then that um, indicated an increase in DOMS. So essentially, if they had to press somebody uh, harder uh, well if they had to press somebody softer in order to see <laughs> in order for them to feel sore you can you can jump in and uh, explain that in a less complicated way dr wolf so basically pain pressure threshold simply refers to how much pressure do you need to apply for someone to start feeling pain right yeah. if you've ever been sore and you've had the displeasure of someone pressing on your leg for example you'll notice ah it goes ouch and so it basically just measures how sore were you the higher the pain pressure threshold, the less sore you are, right? Yeah. Basically, what happened in this study is all three groups had similar pain pressure thresholds, suggesting all three groups, whether they trained to a 4 to 6 RPE, a 7 to 9 RPE, or a 10 RPE, got similarly sore. Importantly, across the study, they seemed to get less sore. And this was indicated by a, an increase in the pain pressure threshold across the study's duration, which meant at the end of the study, they needed to press harder in order to start feeling pain versus at the start. So soreness decreased, right? That's the important thing. Basically, no difference between groups in terms of how sore they got, which is a common misconception, I guess, around RP potentially, where people think, I'm going to train closer to failure, it's going to make it really sore. That may not be the case, based yeah. on the results. Say. And it seems like soreness-wise, at least, as opposed to, you know, what the physiological markers suggested, where we didn't really see any acclimation across the study. With soreness, it does seem like soreness decreases as you expose yourself repeatedly to that same same or similar stimulus of training close to failure or not close to failure. And if you then look at also the perceived recovery scores of, uh, of those groups where a higher score uh, indicates greater recovery, um, the group that trained uh, to failure actually over the course of the study reported gr better recovery um, than the 4 to 6 RPE and 7 to 9 RPE groups, which is yeah. somewhat surprising. Yeah, with that, it is worth noting that the 10 RPE group or the group training to failure started off at a bit of a lower point. So when they first started the studies program, they reported being a little bit more fatigued or a little bit less well recovered than the groups training at lower RPEs. 
but that then did improve over the course of the study, such that by the end of the study, they were recovering about as well, or a little bit better, at least perceptually, than the groups training more submaximally. And their session, session RP. RP. There yeah. you go. There we Hit go. us off. So it was, um, it trended down for for all groups. So for the four to six RP group, seven to nine, and the 10 RP group, um, it started a bit higher, obviously, um, in the 10 RP group. But for all, all three groups seem to be feeling better about the training as things progress. So it seemed like training got easier uh, the longer they did it. Mind blowing. Yep, for sure. And interestingly enough, though, if you look at the actual values, the highest session RP, keep in mind 10 is the maximum score for the highest effort group. So the group training to RP 10 was actually only about seven. So mm. even when training every set to failure on the squat, the bench, the shoulder press, the bent over row, etc. People reported difficulty, don't get me wrong, a 7 out of 10, but they didn't report it being like maximally challenging. So yeah. that's worth noting as well. So to, yeah, you have one more thing to add, I think. No, I don't. No. Hit us off. So, yeah, I just wanted to, 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 to summarize. Um, as far as strength results go, we saw that the, the 4 to 6, the lower RP groups, did did great um seven to nine rp groups also uh did great 10 rp groups not that great um and surprisingly as well the seven to nine plus rp groups uh, which was only looked at on the bench press um did a, a bit less well than the seven to nine and four to six rp groups so it seems that the closer to failure those participants got the worse the strength outcomes as far as hypertrophy goes, as we said, the results are relatively unclear, and I think leaving it at just that makes uh, makes sense versus um, trying to, to take much away from this. Um, as far as recovery goes, physiologically, as you said, it, it seemed like people were not necessarily getting um, getting used to the training, uh, but there was also not a huge difference, or you know. A meaningful difference between groups as far as uh, physiological um, biomarkers for uh, fatigue. Now, as far as soreness goes, everybody got less sore as the, the study progressed, again, with no major uh, differences between conditions. And um, surprisingly, perceived recovery uh, improved more in the higher RPE uh, groups and session RPE for all groups uh, trended downwards as the study progressed. Yeah, I think that's a good summary. Before we go into sort of our interpretations and takeaways and, you know, how it fits within the broader literature, I'm going to put forth a hot take. Are you ready? Okay, yes. This is uh, truly a hot take. So looking at the recovery stuff, as I said, physiologically, not really a difference between training closer to failure or further from failure. They also didn't really get acclimated, right? As far as pain pressure threshold or soreness. Again, not really a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Finally, as far as perceived recovery scale or just essentially how recovered did they feel and as far as session RPE, aka how difficult did they feel the session was, it did seem like training closer to failure made it a little bit harder, at least initially, right? Mm -hmm. But that improved with time. When you look at what categories these markers of recovery fall into, Mm -hmm. You'll kind of see that the last two I mentioned, which were actually impacted by training closer to failure, are mostly psychological. Mm -hmm. Whereas soreness and potentially, obviously, creating kinase and lactate hydrogenase are a bit more physiological. Mm -hmm. And so, based exclusively on the results of this study, you could argue that the effects of training to failure or not on fatigue are mostly perceptual or psychological and that you do get used to it over time. And that physiologically, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of difference between whether you trained an RP5 or an RP10. But it seems like in terms of how difficult you perceive the session to be, and in terms of how recovered you generally feel, it does seem like it's playing a role, at least initially, but this quickly, or relatively quickly, gets better, where by the end of the study, they were actually reporting similar perceived recovery, and their session RP was actually about the same, or not much higher, than the other RP uh, groups. What do you think? Let me make your take even hotter because if we look at the body weight data of the participants throughout the course of the study, 
the four to six, seven to nine, and seven to nine plus RPE groups all gained body weight, while the ten RPE group lost body weight. Um, so they seemed to feel the same way or not get as fatigued, although the other groups gained about a kilo, kilo plus, uh, while they lost around half to 0.7 kilos throughout the course uh, of the study. So, yeah, although t- TNC apply, the, um, the 10 RP, the 10 RP group, the people that were specifically doing 10 RP, um, it was just three people where then you had the seven to nine plus RP um, where there were nine people. What I'm yeah. trying to say is, yes, I somewhat agree with you. I do think that the results here may be indicating that there is a notion of uh, nocebo when it comes to uh, fatigue and mm. closer proximities to failure. Maybe it's all in your head. You know, perhaps. Like, obviously, there is, a physio- there is physiological data around training closer to failure, generally increasing time close to recovery. Likewise, interestingly enough, there is data around higher rep ranges, generally extending how long it takes to recover. But based on this study, and based on the sort of variety of uh, fatigue markers that have been taken, it seems like it may be more perceptual and in the mind than people realize, and that for those factors, you do actually see an acclimation effect. Whereas for physiological markers, as we said, they didn't really adapt to it particularly well. Like the lactate dehydrogenase and the creatine kinase values didn't really recover faster towards the end than the start, right? So just, you know, some food for thought where maybe, and, you know, just because it's perceptual fatigue doesn't mean it's not real fatigue, quote unquote. You know, yeah. you could you could view it as being nocebo and that if you just go into it with relatively uh, an open mind and no prior beliefs in place, it's not actually more fatiguing either physiologically or psychologically, or at least not by a meaningful extent. Or you could say, actually, I think that the perceptual fatigue experienced in this study is meaningful and does exist irrespective of any sort of negative expectancy beliefs coming into it. And could the harder training be feeding into, aside from expectations, could the fact that you're acting, uh, you're doing something harder then feed into the psychological side of it uh, and thus create a potentially an environment where you are feeling more fatigued simply because you did something that feels more fatiguing, but in reality it may not be. <laughs> Indeed. And it could just be that, you know, with the study being set up as it, as it was, people came into the higher RP groups being like, oh, okay, this is going to be right. You know, I think that's, that's very possible, um, especially when they're explaining the study design. It's like, okay, so... We have these four groups, and I was just assigned to the hardest group or the highest effort group. But they might just be primed a little bit to think, yeah, I'm going to be a bit more tired and stuff like that, and the session's going to be harder and what have you. Um, so in terms of practical so practical takeaways and where this study leaves us as far as strength and hypertrophy training go, um, I think we should touch sure. mostly, mostly on the strength stuff and then uh, a slight tap on the hypertrophy side. I agree. So with strength, it's interesting. This fits into the recent meta-analysis by Robinson and colleagues pretty well, actually. So what they saw in this study is that for both the squat and the bench, the lower RPEs of between 4 and 6, or of between 7 and 9, resulted in more favorable improvements in the squat and bench versus higher RPEs. Interestingly, this was the case even on a... um, non-weight equated basis. So one of the most reliable findings we have with regards to improving one max strength, like the Powell does do, right, is that training heavier or closer to your max on a set per set basis, even if you do fewer reps, is going to lead to better improvements. And think about it. The heavier you train, the more specific it becomes. Because ultimately, in a powerlifting comp, you're maxing out. Mm-hmm. But in this study, despite the fact that the higher RP groups, like the groups trained to RP10, used higher intensities, so they trained with a greater percentage of the max, they saw worse strength gains than the lower RP groups. And to me, that's the one bit that's a bit counterintuitive about the strength findings. It does fit in with the previous data by Robinson and colleagues, where they found the same strength gains at lower RPs versus higher RPs. So this is kind of a same general trend of the same or better strength gains with lower RPs versus higher RPs. The reason the authors put forth for why lower RPEs led to better strength gains than higher RPEs hail is due to a lesser intraset fatigue. So essentially, 
between the first rep and the last rep of the set, the higher RPE groups saw a greater amount of intraset fatigue and their velocity from rep one to last rep dropped off more. And the more fatigue you get, the less force you can produce, right? And so when you're doing one max, you're exerting by definition maximum force. And so the reps that you do when you're actually very close to failure towards the end of a set, when you're training hard, you're actually not producing that much force anymore. And that difference in specificity might be what's leading the differences in strength gains here, where when you're training at low RPE, every rep has a pretty good force output mm. and is thus relatively close to what you would do in a competition. And that's kind of what they attributed the strength findings to. I think it's possible. Uh, the finding that training heavier is better for strength gains is at this point so well established that I'm not 100% sure I buy it yet. But I think it's it's worth considering for sure. Um that's basically my take on the strength findings. Anything you want to add? I think it, w- it may be worth um, just touching a bit on the rep ranges that were used. So they used an undulating periodization um, repetition pattern of 10, 8, and 6 reps. So the, the, these participants trained three times a week. And based on the sure. Robinson meta regression and the fact that, that higher RPEs during higher rep repetition sets resulted in worse gains, do we think that if they had done um, lower repetitions, singles, doubles, uh, where they did they did some during the last weeks, but if they had sure. kept it more specific, could, would we have seen better gains? So I'm going to have to break you off there because they didn't, in fact, do 10 reps, 8 reps, and 6 reps throughout the study. They periodized this as well. So they started at 10 reps, 8 reps, and 6 reps, but by the end of the study, they were doing 8, 6, and 4. So on average, they were doing, you know, around 7, 6 reps per set. Uh, They Mm -hmm. did do some heavier work of like 4 reps as well uh, towards the end of the study. So I do think that potentially the the higher rep nature of it might have reduced the impact of RPE a little bit or the impact of higher RPEs where, you know, if you're doing a set of two, going from an RPE of six to 10 actually results in like using 10, 15% more on your North max. But if you're doing 10 reps, going from RPE six to 10, that's an additional like 5% of your max. Because hmm. you can do disproportionately more reps as you drop the weight, right? Where like you can do one rep at 100%, you can do like three reps at 90 but by the time you get to 80, you can do like eight reps oftentimes. So you oh. see a bigger jump in how many reps you can do. And so if we're going to a higher RPE with higher rep ranges, we don't actually increase the weight on the bar by that much, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So maybe there the difference, the benefit of higher RPEs in terms of loading here might have been underplayed as a result of the relatively higher rep ranges being used. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? The, yeah, it makes sense. And the one, the one argument that was uh, placed forth by... Zach uh, and colleagues on the meta regression paper for the potential of higher um, RPE sets being beneficial for strength at lower rep ranges would be the skill component um, as, when you're training for one repetition maximum strength in particular. So learning how to grind like a squad yeah. or a bench press. Um, but yeah, more data is needed on that. Sure. That would be a really cool study. I agree. And for what it's worth, I think that leads us into recommendations for strength. I'm going to try and put something forth here, and if you disagree, you can always I disagree. add or uh, change. So I think for strength, RPE doesn't matter all that much. I mm-hmm. think you're generally better off keeping it at least somewhat maximal, right? And I'm talking RPEs of maybe like 4 to 8 for the most part, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe even a bit lower than that if you want to experiment. Um, that's going to lead to potentially a little bit less fatigue per set, and at the very least per set, you're going to see the same strength gains or maybe a little bit better, right, versus going all the way to failure. You generally want to keep your rep range relatively low to be specific and to have enough loading on the bar because load does absolutely influence strength gains. Equally, there is going to be a time and place where you want to push the RP a little bit higher, even for strength. And I think that's going to be when you're close to competition and you actually want to, A, find out what your top end strength might be to inform attempt selection, B, to practice out the skill of grinding, right? Because if you're always training low RPEs, that may be something you're missing out on. And so maybe you want to do some higher RP work then. And finally, if during the off season you're more concerned with gaining muscle mass as part of a plan to improve your strength long term, in that case, I would see some utility in going a little bit higher RPE as some data around RPE for hypertrophy does suggest that, hey, we want to be training pretty close to failure here. Bang on. I disagree with everything. Um, Good. That's been the Muscle and Feels podcast. Am I right? Yeah. Um, as far as 
do we want to touch on? I mean, I don't think this changes much as far as hypertrophy recommendations go. Um, I agree. You're, you're, you're still, uh, you still want to be close uh, or very close to failure if you're trying to maximize hypertrophy gains. Although, um, you know, just because even if you were to do, let's say you wanted to absolutely maximize strength and you took the study and you took the results of the study as the gospel for strength training and you stayed forever in the four to six RPE range, you'd still be looking at hypertrophy increases, albeit not optimal. 100%. Now let's talk on fatigue and recovery. What do you think the takeaways here are? The takeaways are that as long as you're not doing anything insanely drastic as far as volume increases go um, and you are training hard in general i don't think you should, you need to worry about fatigue that much plus when fatigue is uh is an issue i'm pretty sure you will know uh, if you're regressing in the gym for weeks on weeks your sleep is disrupted you're insanely sore then you can just take a few easy days of training or a few or, or a few days off, and that's that. I never understood the the fear mongering uh, fear mongering about fatigue as if it's like blood pressure, where if you leave it unattended, it may like lead to serious health complications. For sure. And so, yeah. I guess as far as this study specifically goes, there's a couple of takeaways. One is physiologically, it doesn't seem like training closer to failure, as far as creating kinase and lactate dehydrogenase go really caused much additional fatigue. Likewise, it didn't seem like physiologically there was much acclimation. So people didn't get used to training harder or training at low RPEs and thus see less of a, a perturbation physiologically in terms of fatigue. Mm -hmm. Likewise, though, as far as perceptual fatigue went, and I'm talking about stuff like perceived recovery and as far as session RPE, so how difficult they found each session, it did seem like initially, especially, the higher RPE training, training closer to failure, did cause them to one, be more fatigued in terms of perceived recovery, and two, find each session a little bit more challenging in terms of session RP. However, this got better in all groups across the study, where all groups found that, ah, the sessions got a little bit easier. But this was especially true for the higher RP groups or training closer to failure groups. And so, broadly speaking, it seems like, based on this study, there's more perceptual fatigue initially when you start training close to failure or to failure, and that sort of tapers off. And physiologically, it seems like it's pretty comparable between higher RPEs and lower RPEs. Importantly, in the broader literature, there is evidence of physiological fatigue being greater from training closer to failure versus training further from failure. And so while this study doesn't really show anything, I think it's still worth having the general assumption that training closer to failure is going to be a little bit more fatiguing than training further from failure. But I don't think it's going to be a make or break difference. I think this study kind of evidences that hey, total volume load across the, or total workload is probably going to be more predictive of fatigue than how close to failure you train. Yeah, exactly. And that's something we've touched on before with uh, with a meme as well, which on the uh, hierarchy of evidence stands much higher than this mere preprint that hasn't even been peer-reviewed. So basically notes on a, on a tissue. Um, that people are very happy to add sets on sets on sets on sets and do a bunch of volume. But whenever a failure is mentioned, there is this uh, boogeyman of fatigue hanging above their head. So. For sure. It's been the same thing with, it's interesting. I think it's kind of, uh, people attribute lots of fatigue and that being a negative thing to new approaches in general. So I've had the exact same experience with lengthened training. Hey, it's another lengthened episode. Boo. Where uh, some people are like, oh, yeah, sure. It's the same with injury as well, where it's uh, injury and fatigue seem to be two things that people love to bring up in response to any new strategy that seems to be efficacious. Where it's like, mm, sure, length and training could cause some more muscle growth. But what about fatigue, though? It's, I'm sure it's yeah. a lot more fatiguing or it's a lot more injurious. I don't think there's evidence with training to, uh, with long muscle lengths, at least, that it's a lot more fatiguing than short muscle lengths. With training to failure, there is a little bit more evidence, so it's worth keeping in mind, but it's also not worth keeping your mind over. And it's also worth, potentially, keeping in mind that the fatigue experience might be, to some relatively large extent, perceptual versus physiological. Yeah. I don't get the rationale as well. I get maybe some intuitive placebo that, oh, it's harder, therefore more fatigue, yeah. but... Um, on that, I wanted to also, yeah, there was a comment I saw on YouTube. I'm not sure on which video, um, where maybe it was on the one with, with, with Mike and minimum dose training where he was like, wait, 
are, is Dr. Mike recommending to go to a failure during uh, week one of a meso? And it's like, guys, just, just because there's been some like periodization, quote unquote, models proposed as a way to organize your training that, you know, may, may make some sense, at least from an organizational standpoint, there's you, your body's not just going to go, oh, you train to failure without having six weeks of uh, getting used to training cl closer to failure every week. Uh, we're going to now die. Like, it's it's for fine. sure. It's uh, it's funny because now that we've, as the viewers will eventually, viewers and listeners will eventually see and or have heard about already. Actually, um, we did in fact do a twenty six set quad session, and by we I mean I I completed you, it. I did it. nine sets of squats. Indeed, and we in fact survived. And so, if you think that going from an RP eight to an RP nine on three of your sets is going to break your recovery, maybe it won't. Yeah. And okay, last one. Like when it comes to those uh, silly anecdotes, there's so many silly anecdotes from the other uh, side of the, yep. the argument where, bro, like you can go and play. We can go now with Milo and play basketball without having played basketball ever, sprinting up and down, jumping, falling, doing stuff that our body is legit not used to. Kissing. Kissing. And then we will. Uh, We'll be a bit sore the next day, and that's that's about it. Like if you're just doing basketball, and then we do multiple balls. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Absolute.